How you doing? It's book raffle time. Raffle time. All right, the winner of the Gone and the Going Away is. Oh my god, I can't read that at all. What number? <laughs> number 17. Is it a rod? Rod? Yes! Woo! Good for you! And the winner of Safe from the Neighbors. Um. Paulette Livers. Yeah. Oh, We also have a few social announcements for y'all. Um, there are sign-up sheets for the open mic readings this week. Um, the first one will be Tuesday night in St. Luke's at 9.30. The second one will be Wednesday night at 9.30 in Humphreys. Um, there are 12 slots per night, five-minute readings. Um, there are sign-up sheets are at McClurg. You can sign up. It'll be fun. There'll be refreshments. That means alcohol. All right. Um, tomorrow at 1 o'clock, there'll be another van run to... Mon Eagle, if you haven't been to the dollar store yet and you really want to go. At 1 o'clock, uh, meet in front of McClurg on the lawn. And tomorrow night, poker night, point toward your mouth. Poker night. At uh, 10 o'clock, St. Luke's, the study room next to the laundry room. Bring your money. <laughs> or goods, what, whatever. One more thing, um, there is a lost and found bag of books on the shelf back there. The books are inscribed to Charlotte. I think we have a couple of Charlottes here, so it belongs to one of you. <laughs> All right, um, please welcome Steve Yarbrough. Yes. Remember how wide I always checks to make sure it's not spiked? I keep hoping it will be. <laughs> Um, <laughs> um, I need to thank Wyatt for having me back. This is always the highlight of my year. Um, my lovely wife, Eva. And uh, tonight, my editor, Gary Fiskajohn, is with us. Um, aside from meeting my wife and getting to raise my daughters, Getting to work with him um, for 13 years over the last five books has been the best thing that ever happened to me, and I would wish a similar fate for everyone here. Um, I've got a novel coming out on August 6th called, um, what the hell is the title? <laughs> the Realm of Last Chances. Um, which is my first book not to be set in Mississippi. I think, and I'm just going to read from the front, um, and I think the only thing I need to tell you, I'm going to skip about three pages. There's a character named Matt, and in the pages I'm going to skip, uh, you would have learned that his last name is Drennan, which only matters because he has a friend who calls him MD, and I don't want you to think he's got a medical degree. Um, they were both 50 when they moved to Massachusetts, settling in a small town a few miles north of Boston. Like a lot of people around the country over the last few years, they'd recently experienced a run of bad luck. Due to the state budget crisis, she'd lost her job as vice president for academic personnel at a large University of California campus in the Sacramento Valley. The year before her layoff, everyone, even the football coaches, had been subjected to mandatory furloughs. And things had turned ugly as the union blamed the shortfall on managerial bloat. She'd had a hand in denying tenure to a number of professors, and many faculty members rejoiced when the administration was reorganized and she received her pink slip. His business was construction. He was the man you engaged if you needed to have something small and delicate done and could pay for fine work. You had to accept certain things about him, though. 
He'd come and go on his own terms, and he would bring a small bows along and listen to music throughout the day. He wouldn't have much to say. The fact that he was working for you didn't necessarily mean he'd return every phone call. People who'd put up with such idiosyncrasies when the economy was healthy proved a lot less understanding after the downturn. By the time they left the valley, he hadn't had a job for close to six months. Her friends had always considered them an odd pair. He was from someplace down around Bakersfield, a tall, angular man who had attended college only a semester before dropping out. His great passion was stringed instruments, and he could play the guitar, mandolin, dobro, and banjo well enough to earn money doing it if he'd chosen to, but the only audience he ever performed for was the other amateur musicians in a sordid hangar zone who gathered at a crossroads grocery outside Sacramento on Friday nights. That was where they'd met when she went there with a friend a year or so after the demise of her first marriage. Of medium height, trim, and fit, she'd earned a PhD in comp lit and published a handful of articles on writers like Kafka, Brock, and Svivo before moving into administration. With a laugh, she sometimes referred to her days in the classroom as my previous life. She didn't think she'd been a very good teacher, perhaps because she had trouble reaching out to those she taught who were often first-generation college students from migrant families. She loved cooking and sometimes wondered if she'd missed her calling and should have owned a restaurant. She had what she always described as bad hair. Blonde, it had always been thin, and as she aged it grew even thinner. The valley's arid climate didn't help. When she attended a conference in the Deep South or went back home to Pennsylvania, the moisture in the air lent it a bit more body. But it is what it is, she liked to say. She had watched a couple middle-aged women, friends of her mother, quietly go crazy in the small town where she'd grown up doing all sorts of bizarre things that caused others pain and kept the local gossips entertained. And she'd promised herself that when her time came to grow older, she would accept it with grace. Moving to Massachusetts was itself an act of acceptance. She got another job in academic personnel, this time at a state college, where she'd earned barely half her former salary, and they sold their house in the valley for barely half of what it had once been worth, and bought a three-story colonial that needed lots of work. They wouldn't hire anyone to fix it up. Cal could do whatever needed doing to any house, anywhere. The couple owned a dog, a 10-year-old black lab named Susie, that they'd given themselves for their fifth anniversary. The first evening in the new house, with most of their things still in Beacon's cartons, they decided to take her out for a walk. She'd had a rough trip across the country, mostly riding in the cab of Cal's pickup, though a few times they switched and let her get in the car with Kristen. It was August and hotter than either of them had expected. This feels like New Orleans, she said as they stepped off the porch. I don't know if we can make it here without AC. He gestured at the house directly across the street where a pair of window units droned on the second floor. I'll go look for one of those as soon as we get unpacked. We can put it in the bedroom. From what I read online, the most we'll ever get is three or four weeks of heat and humidity. Some years, even less. The neighborhood, according to the realtor who had helped them find the house, was a good one, on the dividing line between two distinctly different North Shore towns. The one to the east, Cedar Park, was a little more upscale, with a fine seafood restaurant and a Mexican place the lady claimed would pass muster even with Californians. It also had a bakery where you could buy real Irish soda bread, a couple of nice cafes, several antique stores, and an antiquarian bookshop. They never bothered to remove the Christmas lights on Main Street, she told them, so even a balmy summer night seemed to hint of nutmeg and cider, and you almost expected to hear sleigh bells. An early temperance movement stronghold, it was still legally dry, though you could get a drink in both restaurants provided you first ordered food. 
Montvale, the town to the west in which they technically resided, though its center was farther away, had a grittier, blue-collar air. According to Wikipedia, back in the 70s, it had earned an entry in the Guinness Book of World Records for the highest number of gas stations in a one-mile stretch. Most of those were gone now, apparently displaced by liquor stores. The day they made the offer on the house, Cal had counted seven. Chains like CVS, Walgreens, Stop and Shop, and Shaw's were driving out the mom and pops, but he'd noticed two independent hardware stores within a few hundred yards of each other. He hoped to scope them out over the next few days. A lot of things seem strange here, she said as they turned down the sidewalk. Like what? She nodded at the house they were passing. Like almost all the other Victorians, the colonials in the neighborhood, it must have been built well over a hundred years ago. Through the window, she could see a couple sitting there watching TV. Dropping her voice, she said, their car has an Obama sticker on it. Well, it's Massachusetts. But they're watching Bill O'Reilly, and that means Fox News. <laughs> Maybe they're disillusioned, aren't you? <laughs> she knew how he voted, the same ticket she did, but sometimes didn't have a clue what he was thinking. He was prone to silence. It was a matter of aesthetics, she supposed, like his disdain for musicians who played too many notes. Not with Obama, she answered. He laughed. With me? Not you either, she said, refusing to consider whether she was telling the whole truth. He jiggled Susie's chain. Guess that means it's you, Pooch. <laughs> they walked around the neighborhood for 30 or 40 minutes, both of them wearing shorts and t-shirts, and in no time, his were soaked. He'd always perspired a lot, but unlike her, he relished being sweaty. In California, she'd often return home to discover that he'd switched off the AC, even on days when the temperature soared above 100. They had a black-bottomed pool overhung by tall pines, and she frequently found him there, reclining on the steps at the shallow end, a visor pulled low over his eyes, three or four empty beer bottles on the poolside, his ever-present bows providing string band music from the nearby picnic table. When Susie paused to relieve herself, he handed Kristen the leash, pulled a plastic bag from his pocket, and bent to collect the waste. They were in Cedar Park proper, in an intersection maybe 300 yards downhill from their new house. While knotting the bag, he asked if she'd noticed how many streets were unmarked. From here, she could see two other intersections, but not a single street sign. You're right, she said. That's funny, isn't it? Do you think the kids are stealing the signs? He stuck the first bag into a second one, then tied it up and put it in his pocket. He'd always done that, and it had always troubled her to know that he was walking along beside her with dog shit in his pocket. <laughs> she had objected once, but he said he'd rather have it there than dangling from his hand where everyone could see it. And for reasons she couldn't specify, that troubled her even more. <laughs> I doubt kids are stealing the signs, he said. They just don't put them up to begin with. They probably figure if you don't know where you're going, you most likely don't belong here. Who knows? They may be right. She lay awake a long time that first night, drenched in perspiration and thinking about that observation until she gave up on sleep and got out of bed. In the bathroom, she took a quick shower, toweled herself off, slipped into the thin robe she had worn in motels from one side of the continent to the other and went downstairs. In the darkened hallway, Susie lay twitching, no doubt lost in a troublesome dream. So she stroked her neck until she woke, and together they went outside. Kristen sat on the porch steps with Susie perched beside her. We'll get used to it here, she whispered, realizing that she really didn't have much more choice than the dog. Their first full day was spent unpacking boxes, more than 200, all told. Before beginning to arrange their contents, he insisted on breaking down the cardboard and stacking it neatly in the backyard. Once he learned where a recycling center was, he said he'd haul it away. Toting out all that cardboard required more than 40 trips, many of which started on the upper floors. 
He got so hot he pulled off his t-shirt and hung it from the railing of their rear deck, but he enjoyed the exercise. Sitting behind the wheel in the pickup for five straight days, he'd had too much time to think, and most of his thoughts were dark. Every time Kristen's car disappeared from the rearview mirror, he whipped out his cell phone to call and make sure she hadn't gotten lost or had an accident or turned around and headed back. Certainly what awaited them on the opposite side of the country was anybody's guess. After depositing the last of the boxes on the shoulder high stack, he surveyed the houses on either side as well as the ones behind them over a flimsy fence. He could be seen, he knew, from any number of windows, just as he'd been able to see any number of backyards when he looked out of his own third story window at dusk the previous evening and observed a woman early 50s, reddish hair, chunky bill, khaki knee shorts, and a blue red Sox t-shirt, walking around the corner of the house directly behind theirs. She looked over her shoulder as if fearful somebody might be following. Apparently satisfied that no one was, she pulled a pack of cigarettes from her pocket, and while he watched, stuck one between her teeth. She withdrew a lighter and the flame flicked on and off. Then she squatted with her back against the wall and enjoyed the cigarette, her eyes closed the whole time. He knew he ought to quit watching. It made him feel dirty, but couldn't tear himself away. On a trip to Shaw's to buy coffee and paper towels, he spotted some window units sandwiched into the seasonal section between marshmallows and charcoal. Their second evening in the house, he installed one in their bedroom. Finally cool, she slept a full nine hours, waking shortly before seven. At some point during the night, she'd heard him climb out of bed, the door then opening and closing. They were back to normal, she guessed, her asleep, him awake. That had been the routine for years. She never knew what he did after he left, but sometimes in the morning she'd find a guitar or mandolin lying on the living room couch, a couple of picks on the coffee table beside an empty whiskey bottle. On the first trip they'd ever taken together to a bluegrass festival in Napa Valley, she'd loved watching him move from one group of parking lot pickers to another, joining in on whatever tune they were playing, never at a loss. He didn't even ask what key the song was in, just slid a little clamping device up or down the guitar neck and started strumming. He told her it was called a capo. When you've got one, all you need to do is play in G or D. Put the capo at the second fret, and G becomes A, D becomes E, and so on. That night they ate dinner at a country inn and drank two bottles of wine, and though they had reserved a pair of rooms, they needed only one. Opening her eyes the next morning, she found him propped on his elbow, studying her face as if he hoped to memorize her features. His guitar was standing beside the bed. Play something for me, she said. Now, however, his instruments were thousands of miles away in the home of a former colleague of hers who soon would FedEx them. And he was beside her on his back, his mouth wide open and an arm thrown over her chest. She lay there looking at his long, thin fingers, cupped as if in supplication. Having been with him for more than 15 years, she thought she knew how large his hand was, but for an instant it looked as garish as a flesh-colored fielder's glove. That it could once have been the source of pleasure seemed impossible. She gently shifted his arm aside, mm, he muttered, and slid out of bed. In the room next door, which would eventually serve as her study, she flipped on the light. Books were piled against the wall on top of her desk, even underneath it. When she stepped into this room for the first time a few weeks ago on their home hunting expedition, a pair of bunk beds came together in one corner, and the floor was littered with the kind of junk only boys could own. Two or three baseballs, an aluminum bat, several pairs of smelly, mud-encrusted sneakers of various sizes, a surprisingly realistic replica of an AK-47, a desktop computer with a keyboard that had a huge wad of chewing gum stuck to the space bar. A milk crate was full of video games and some of the titles made her shudder. Resident Evil 4, World of Warcraft, Killer 7. 
On the wall hung a Tom Brady poster. Somebody had used a black magic marker to render the famous quarterback toothless. <laughs> She'd been afraid to look at Cal that day. During the previous week, they'd seen so many homes she'd lost count and he had detected major flaws in most of them before they even got inside. But when they entered this one, he kept silent until he was standing in the opening between the living room and dining room where he thumped the white facing. These belly casings, he observed, most likely have pocket doors behind them. They were common in houses like this. They look real nice and can help preserve warmth. He pointed at the fireplace in the corner. That's unusual in a dining room. Examining it, he said, looks like the original firebox, carved brass. In the basement, he ran his hand over one of the beams. Hemlock, he told her. It's good, strong timber, resistant to rot. They ran single spans in here, too. By then, she knew that after they told the realtor goodbye and returned to their hotel, he'd sigh and say they might as well do it. They'd make an offer on this house, and it would be accepted. And in five or six months, she'd be standing right where she was now, trying to find the new beginning she wanted to believe must be inherent in each ending except the last one. She drew her nightgown over her head and put on the shorts and t-shirts she'd tossed on her desk. She went downstairs and fed Susie, then laced up her tennis shoes and hooked the leash to the dog's collar. In California, especially in spring and summer, the days often got hot before she really got going. While resolve was a word she'd never had much use for, generally people who employed it as a verb lacked it as a quality, She'd resolved to begin her mornings earlier in this new place. She'd become uncomfortably aware that fewer of them remained. They started off, Susie dropping her nose to sniff the ground every few feet. Newspapers lay on a couple of porches reminding her they ought to subscribe to the globe. A couple of houses down on her side of the street, an elderly woman sat in a porch rocker sipping her coffee, and despite the reputation of New Englanders for being unfriendly, she raised her hand and waved. Such a simple gesture shouldn't have meant all that much, but right then it did. Kristen lifted her hand and smiled, but kept on moving because her throat had tightened and she wasn't sure she could speak. In summers, when she was a child and out of school, her father would have been sitting in a porch rocker too, drinking his coffee and reading the Harrisburg paper. But he never would have seen anybody out walking a dog. Back then, they roamed the neighborhood at will, and nobody saw anything wrong with that. Her family lived on a narrow strip of land between Penn's Creek and the Susquehanna, and dogs didn't run away or get lost because the bridge over the creek was an open, great construction they couldn't cross. Sometimes you'd see the Airedale that belonged to her next-door neighbors, the Canalti, standing there looking as if he might try it, but eventually whatever reason he possessed would take over, forcing him to turn around and head for home. Sooner or later on those mornings in the late 60s, her mother would get up, go outside, and join her father, and through her window, she would hear them exchange pleasantries. How are you, dear? Fine, and you? Perfectly wonderful. I don't think I ever rested better. Want part of the paper? No, thank you. I believe I'll just sit here for a while and listen to the morning. Whatever sounds the morning made, her own ear wasn't attuned to them. Sometimes she'd fall asleep again, but more often than not, she'd pad downstairs. And before long, her father would come back inside and begin making breakfast. <coughs> At the time, it hadn't occurred to her that her family was living the kind of life that many people around the country were starting to question. As far as she knew, it was just normal. And if it was normal for them, she figured, it must be for everyone else. But once or twice, she'd wandered into the living room where her father was watching the evening news and seen footage of young people lying around in the mud up in Woodstock with glazed expressions on their faces, or wielding bull horns on the steps of some building in Berkeley or Madison, or burning a flag on the Capitol Mall. Why are they doing that? She once asked. 
Her dad was having his evening drink a double shot of Tullamore Dew. A copy of Look lay spread open on his knee. The sound on the zenith was turned down so low you could barely hear it. Doing what? She pointed at the screen. Burning the flag. He squinted at the TV. They're against the war. Was setting the flag on fire make the war stop? No. Then why do they do it? It's a symbol. Of what? Everything they don't like about America. Or at least a lot of what they don't like. What else don't they like? He drained his glass of whiskey, closed the magazine, and laid it on the floor by his easy chair. Then, moving with the stealthy grace of a big man who'd once played football at the small college on the other side of town, he leaped out of the chair, gathered her in his arms, and pretended he was rocking her in a cradle, even though she must have been seven or eight years old. They don't like this, he said. She was looking right up into his rosy face. When the high school where he and her mother taught held its Christmas parties, he always played Santa. So deeply had he impressed himself on everyone as a man of good cheer. This what? Family bliss, he said, faint fumes on his breath. They hate it worse than cancer. As if his statement were the moral equivalent of a dollar bill, she accepted it at face value, leaving aside any questions she might have had as to why anybody, anywhere, at any time, could hate the sight of a happy family. She was in her father's arms, and he was holding her so high above the zenith that she no longer could see those people burning the flag, and within seconds had forgotten they even existed. She walked around for more than an hour, familiarizing herself with Cedar Park. There was an elementary school five or six blocks from their house, and a little beyond that, on the other side of the commuter rail that she'd been told had its terminus in Haverhill, she passed Cedar Park High, deserted now, except for a couple pickups she assumed must belong to the janitorial staff. Otherwise, Tremont Street was lined with body shops, auto parts stores, lube centers. She saw a car wash, too, and decided that either today or tomorrow she'd ask Cal to run her Volvo through. A thick layer of road scum covered the car, and some of it had probably attached itself before they even left the valley. It was odd to think that a speck of dirt picked up on the one end of the continent could have made it to the other, but she supposed it wasn't out of the question. When she trudged back up the hill into Montvale, she was bone tired. Susie was doing even worse, panting like her heart was about to burst, her loose tongue sprinkling the sidewalk. At one point, Kristen thought she was going to lie down and refuse to walk any farther. If that happened, she'd have to sit there beside her until Susie made up her mind to get moving. She couldn't carry an 80-pound lab. But they finally reached a street where a fair amount of activity seemed to be in progress. In one yard, two boys were tossing a baseball back and forth, their father backing out in a black pickup that said Kelly's Heating and Plumbing on the door, and in the next yard, another boy was laying out balls and mallets, getting ready for a game of croquet. The old woman who had been sitting in her rocker the last time she walked by was now down on her knees beneath the less hydrangea, wielding a small spade. Across the street, on the porch of a blue Queen Anne with bay windows on all three floors and badly chipped shingles, a man leaned over to pick up his paper. He had salt and pepper hair, looked to be about 40, and wore a beige terry cloth bathrobe. He opened the paper, glanced at the front page, then stood up straight, and his gaze met hers before traveling downward in a manner she found vaguely insolent. Hey, he called, where'd you get that t-shirt? Uncertain what she was wearing, she looked down to see. It was one she'd bought years ago in San Francisco in a clean, well-lighted place for books. There was a drawing of Milan Kundera on it, and beneath his image, the legend, Kundera Rocks. I got it in California, she said. We just moved here. I saw the plates on the car and truck. He stepped off the porch and into the street. I'm Matt. Welcome to the neighborhood. 
As she and Susie moved toward him, it occurred to her that in a manner of speaking, she might soon become his boss, that he could easily be a professor at North Shore State College, which was only a few miles away. Even in the most educated part of the country, how many non-academics would you meet on the street who'd respond like this to Kundera? I'm Kristen, she said. Pleased to meet you. He pointed at the dog. And who's that? Susie. He bent and patted her head. Looks like a real sweetheart. I think we walked too long. She's not used to hills and humidity. Plenty of both around here, he said once more glancing at her chest. You like Kundera? The question wasn't complicated, but an honest answer would be. She didn't read nearly as much as she used to, and she hadn't read the Czech writer's last three or four books. She didn't even know the titles. Once she left the faculty and moved into administration, she began spending a lot of time in meetings and even more time poring over personnel files checking people's credentials and publications. When she did read a novel, it usually had short chapters and a linear plot. I liked his early work a lot, she said. Me too. What's the cutoff for you? She tried to recall the name of the last one she'd read. Immortality, maybe? It's even further back for me. I thought the work thinned out badly when he began writing in French. But then, you know, he lost his fictional universe, just like Le Carre. He was making her feel stupid, and since she knew she wasn't, she wanted to end the conversation. Well, you may have a point, she said. Sure. Because of the pyrotechnics, people don't think of Kundera as a Cold War novelist. But that was his landscape. When he lost it, that's about like taking Mississippi away from Faulkner. You've got to know where you are to write about it well, don't you think? What she thought was that she'd better find out whether or not they'd be working at the same place. <laughs> One lesson she had absorbed in California was that you needed to keep your distance from the faculty. When the time came to make a tough decision, you shouldn't let sentiment intrude. So many good people were looking for jobs that you couldn't justify rewarding the unaccomplished or inept. You sound like you've got a serious interest in literature, she said. Are you a professor by any chance? This provoked the most curious response. She'd think about it off and on for the remainder of the day and would even wake up the next morning with it still on her mind. He looked up the street and then down at his feet as his facial muscles lost all semblance of tone. He tucked the paper under his arm and said he worked in an Italian deli on Main Street in Montvale and that sometime she ought to try their lobster salad. Then he climbed the porch steps and went inside. I pissed, shit, and came all at the same time, Duchesne said while he, Matt, and Frankie worked on a trio of four-foot subs for a retirement party at Fellsway Fence Company. <laughs> Frankie always insisted they finish the special orders before the lunch crowd arrived. Selling sandwiches was 70% of his business, and working people didn't have all day to stand in line. See, I'd gotten banged up the previous night in the big game against Redding, Duchesne continued. And to kill the pain, I went to sleep on a heating pad. Damn thing burned a hole in my hip, and then all my fucking effluvia got in the wound and created a septic situation. And next thing I know, I'm in the hospital dying. Which is tragic, right? Because at the time, I'm just 16. My old man told me later that the doctor said I was a goner. And I'll tell you something, Ziz. I'm not one of those people who questions the existence of God. I know he's up there because while I was dying, I saw him. His son, anyways, him and the Virgin Mary. Only thing was, Jesus looked older than she did. I don't know how to explain that. Some shit's just plain mysterious. <laughs> Dish, I got limited interest right now in theology, Frankie Zezza said, dropping black olives down the middle of a sub in a perfect row. His wife, though raised Catholic, had recently converted to some off-brand Protestant denomination with a high percentage of Tea Party members. <laughs> Frankie himself had been proclaiming his atheism ever since high school. 
You ask me, religion's running the goddamn country. It's not religion I'm talking about, Ziz. It's mystery. It's the mystery at the fucking heart of things. The mystery at the middle of my fucking heart, Frankie said, is what made me hire this douchebag in the first place. If somebody could answer that one, I'd say it was positively Socratic. <laughs> The previous afternoon, a customer had ordered a pound of roast beef. Since the tray in the display case had only a few strands left, Duchet strolled into the back room, pushed aside the better part of a 16-pound hunk that Matt had opened just that morning, and took out a new one. Frankie bought them from a high-end wholesaler who used no preservatives or caramel coloring, so they didn't last long, and each one cost close to $80. Lawrence Duchet was in his mid-twenties and a dead ringer for the actor Steve Buscemi, which helped the Saugus police identify him a couple years ago when he tried to fence a bunch of laptops stolen from Best Buy. He was one of several guys Frankie had hired after they got out of jail. Most of them had worked out well, as he liked to note, and two owned businesses themselves now. Duchet, however, was proving peculiarly inept. His first day on the job, ogling a female customer while slicing pastrami, he caught his sleeve in the burkle and might have lost a finger or two if Matt hadn't reached over and shut off the machine. He overcharged some and undercharged others. He cut thick slices when people asked for thin and vice versa. One day he shut up in flip-flops. You're not still pissed about that roast beef, are you? He asked now. Pissed? Frankie said, no, douche, of course not. Why would I be pissed? I'm really happy about it. I'm especially pleased for Eddie and Wolf. Who are they? Eddie and Wolf are my fucking mutts, douche. They'll be the ultimate beneficiaries of your generosity. Day after tomorrow, they'll chow down on eight or ten pounds of rotten roast beef. They finished the subs, and Duchet was dispatched to deliver them. As soon as the door closed behind him, Zizza shook his head. That guy, he said, is a walking oil spill. <laughs> Matt pulled off the gloves they had to wear when handling food. They were made of powder-free polyethylene and supposedly could not cause an allergy, but lately he developed red patches on both hands around the base of each knuckle. As he'd learned some time ago, every profession has its hazards. He might have been better off if they kept him in jail, he said, then instantly wished he hadn't offered that opinion. Frankie had been his best friend from first grade through high school, though nobody could figure out what drew them together. Matt Drennan, bookish, upper middle class, college bound, and Frankie Zizza, a working class Italian who did so badly in school that his father finally persuaded the principal to release him each day at lunchtime so he could hustle down to the deli and learn to make the sandwiches he'd spend the rest of his life selling. Each of them had always been able to tell when he had aroused the other's displeasure, and Matt knew he'd incurred Frankie's just now. You really think, Zizza asked, that Duchet would be better off someplace like Shirley, where a couple of BGs could hold him down every night while a third one banged him in the ass? No. Then we've achieved rare concord, MD, because guess what? What? I don't think so either. <laughs> Frankie pulled his own gloves off and walked around in front of the display case to the table where the coffee dispenser stood. He filled a styrofoam cup and took a swallow, then promptly leaned over and spat it into the trash can. Fucking douchebag, he cried, slapping his forehead. Again, he makes the coffee out of yesterday's grounds. Around 11, the lunch crowd began to stream in, the motion detector above the door emitting one beep after another, a line starting to form. Day in and day out, you saw the same people, usually at the same time. And one thing that surprised Matt when he started working here was that they tended to order the same stuff on each visit. At 11.15, Ryan Kelly, who owned Kelly's Heating and Plumbing, would come in with mud on his knees and ask for the chicken cutlet sandwich with provolone and prosciutto. Billy Sutherland, the branch manager at the Main Street B of A, would appear at 12 sharp and request a boneless buffalo chicken sub on a braided sesame roll and a seafood salad on focaccia.
While waiting for his sandwiches, he always grabbed two bags of oats, sour cream, and onion chips, and two bottles of root beer. Matt observed their predictability was something akin to horror. But after a while, he became their accomplice. He quit asking what they wanted, instead saying, the usual? Like robots, they nodded, and as if he'd been programmed, he slapped the same meat on the same bread, along with the same condiments. Once, when he and Frankie were cleaning up at the end of the day, he explained why he found such repetition appalling. I mean, if you're going to buy your lunch at the same place every day at exactly the same time, why not at least try something different? Would it really upset Ryan's equilibrium if for once in his life he ate pastrami with spicy mustard on a bulky? Frankie was sponging off the counter just as he had at closing time every day since he was 13 years old. The mass of men lead lives of quiet desperation. You know who said that, don't you? Of course, but I'm surprised you do. My kid told me about it, but the row was full of shit, and so are you. He stepped over to the sink and wrung out the sponge, twisting it a little harder than necessary. Most people just don't crave as much stimulation as you do, MD. They know there's a lot they hadn't experienced and never will, but they're okay with that. Because some of what they don't know might flip their lives upside down if they did. You know what I mean? Matt didn't bother to reply. It was always there between them, unspoken condemnation liberally seasoned by 35 years of unbroken devotion. Today he made Ryan Kelly the usual and watched him leave to eat lunch in peace before replacing yet another leaky faucet or clearing one more block drain. He prepared Billy's regular order and when the three drunks who daily came in together appeared, he served them their bologna sandwiches and undercharged them like Frankie had instructed, tossing a free bag of chips into each sack. Then, as things were just beginning to taper off, he looked up and got the first genuine surprise of the day when the door opened and Paul Nowicki stepped through it. A lifelong resident of Montvale, whose wire rims might have made him look scholarly had he not been so big, Nowicki owned one of two hardware stores on Main Street. He was four or five years older than Matt. And like Frank, he had taken over the family business when his father retired. When people used the term solid citizen, they generally had someone like Paul in mind. For years, he'd looked after his sister who had been born with some type of rare heart disease. You'd see him helping her into and out of her car, walking her to church, waiting for her at the doctor's office. He never had a family of his own until she died, and everyone figured it was because of his devotion. If he refused to care for her, who would? That's just the kind of guy he is, they'd say. He was an usher at St. Patrick's and a member of the Board of Selectmen. Because he'd always loved dogs, he helped establish the local chapter of Paul's. As far back as Matt could recall, he'd been unable to think of Paul without also picturing the team of Clydesdales that pulled the Budweiser beer wagon in TV commercials. He was big, he was reliable, he did nothing purely for show. All right, hell, he was noble. The only problem was that a little over four years ago, he had married Matt's ex-wife and become stepfather to both of his daughters. Whether or not all activity ceased the moment Paul walked in, Matt would never know. He just knew that it seemed to. Later on, he couldn't remember which customers were still present or if they appeared to be taking note, though he hoped not. Hey, Paul, he said, relieved that the words actually came out. What can I do for you? To his amazement, Nowicki blushed, even the tip of his nose turning red. I was wondering, he said, if I could speak to you in private. Would that be all right? Matt turned to Frankie, who was taking a record amount of time to rewrap a chunk of hot ham, giving the task his full attention. He acted as if he hadn't heard the request, though he must have. Rather than ask him if it would be all right to step away, Matt pulled off his gloves, lifted the counter leaf, and led Paul into the back room. The space was small, and with a man no wicky size in there, crowded. Matt stood with his back to the counter where the charbroiler rested. It felt like a defensive position. Paul pointed at the grill. 
I didn't know you guys cooked in here. Every now and then somebody would come in wanting a breakfast sandwich. That's about the only thing we sell that needs to be cooked. Is it on the menu? No, but if you want one, Frankie will make it. That's good to know. But of course, that's not what I came to talk about. I never thought it was. Paul stuffed his hands into his pockets. Look, Matt, he said, I try to stay out of here. You know that, don't you? Before you went to work for Frankie, I probably came by three or four times a week. There's not a better Italian sub anywhere. Matt shrugged. You can come in whenever you choose. It's a free country, and Frankie could always use the business. I know that, but I think you and I have both been operating under the assumption that you've got your sphere and I've got mine. You used to come in the hardware from time to time, but not anymore. I haven't been undertaking any home improvement projects lately. You're being ironic, I guess, Nowicki said, but that's actually what I came to talk to you about. He said that the previous weekend, when the girls returned home after their regular sleepover, they made a few remarks that got Carla upset. I understand they weren't complaining. They were just laughing about stuff and having a good time, but their mom sees things differently. The stuff in question was the decay they had observed in the house that had formerly belonged to their grandmother. The hot water faucet was gone from the second floor bathtub and the only way you could turn it on was to twist the stem with the pliers that lay on the windowsill. The toilet handle in the half bath was broken though you could flush it manually by pulling the top off the tank, sticking your hand in and lifting the stopper. Two boards on the back porch had rotted clean through. The drain in the kitchen sink kept backing up and disgorging some kind of soupy substance that stank to high heaven. All the light fixtures were so full of dead insects you could sometimes hear their bodies frying. <laughs> Angie and Lexa had evidently painted quite a picture, making the house sound like the one Herman Monster's family occupied. In the back corner of the deli's in the corner of the deli's back room, there was an enormous reach-in freezer that had three doors, and could have held a huge amount of frozen food, except for one thing: it didn't work. It hadn't for at least 20 years, according to Frankie, but he'd never gotten rid of it because it wouldn't fit through the opening into the front room. It had been there in 1984 when his father renovated and nobody considered the possibility that it might ever quit and need to be removed. Matt focused on that freezer now as a means of keeping himself anchored. Lately he felt insubstantial, weightless, as if he were merely the idea of a person rather than the real thing. People weren't just a past or a present or a set of extinguished expectations. They had to have a future too, and for himself he failed to see one. He felt as if he could readily be brushed off, as if right now, should he choose to, no wiki could squat him aside as if he were no more momentous than a fly or a net. Matt, Paul said, you know I don't mean to offend you, right? I'm just trying to call attention to the problem because, well, it really bothers Carla. So look, if you'd like to come over after closing time and get some stuff for the place, some faucets maybe, and a handle for that toilet, a few cans of outdoor latex, some drain opener, insecticide, whatever, I've got them, and they're yours. Hell, I even have lumber. I could help you do whatever needs to do into that back porch. There had been a time when Matt Drennan could talk his way out of almost any jam. When explanations and justifications and complex and simple evasions came to him so easily it got boring. Then one morning in the basement of the Harvard Book Emporium, surrounded by millions upon millions of words, he tapped his own verbal reservoir and found it empty. He couldn't think of a single thing to say that day, and he couldn't think of a single thing to say now. The silence took as much of a toll on the other man as it did on him. Finally, Nowicki reached out and wrapped a massive arm around him, whispering, Jesus, Matt, I'm sorry. Thank you.